welcome to this International Women's Day webinar, which is being hosted by the Elma Francois Institute for Research and Debate of the Cipriani College of Labor and Cooperative Studies. The theme is Taking Action Against the Bias, and I am your moderator, Yemi Obubanket. Before I introduce our wonderful panelists, it is my pleasure to have us listen to a student of the college, Ms. Zakia Gill, who has a spoken word presentation to set the tone. Hi, um, I decided I'm going to do a, a raw video for you guys for International Women's with all the theatrics and all that sort of nonsense. Um, it's called My Petition. Like, share, comment, and really hope it blesses your heart. Driver, wait. Don't roll up that partition, please, until I make my petition. A sincere little girl I've been residing in Beyonce's world, holding on to her every verb, feminist. But as I grew older, I realized she is nothing but a contradiction. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't ever wake up flawless. I wake up fearless, but even I am self-conscious. And I can never face society with bath beneath my eyes and yampy stick to my eyelids. Jeez, you all place too many unrealistic expectations on this young girl from country. And at the age of 25, I still enjoy walking around naked and still hoping and praying that one day that this Jean and Dina ideology would simply cease. Since 1956, we have had that song on repeat. I wish we can reverse the hands of time, then reimburse every woman that paid her dues to society with her dignity. Then spell change on those with a sexist mindset that the objectification of a woman's sexuality is just another form of entertainment but what happens to her mental stability when this flash balls begin to burn out her iris and her pride is at risk she begins she's falling from grace what a dismissed grace society is just another psychological carpenter he is screwing with her mental he is boxing her in and labeling her repulsive he is still picking at her petals leaving her with bruises on her face now she's going without a trace living with a pain not even with eternity time will ever be able to replace so welcome to real life with a survival plate of hot lies and a cold glass of fake sacrifice on the side, convincing her she needs to expose more than her soul to the globe in order to feel love. So we snub any woman that exhibits any form of common sense or intelligence. And society have tarnished your image so you can't even see your true beauty. But don't you know, beauty lies in the eyes of the beholder. Are you in love with your reflection? How do you see yourself? I wish I had an extra pair of eyes to give you so you could see you the exact same way that I do. Because I see perfection in all your flaws. This is for all the single mothers that fight it alone. You deserve an award. I pray you run and never get weary. I know it could be scary. All is typical and... Breast cancer survivors, those who are barren, who will never be able to conceive, doesn't make you less than a woman. You are only human. It wasn't your intention to strip, but you have to pay for your tuition. I'll tell you the exact same thing that Avi told me. You have people to study, do you? They'll speak about you anyway. We are obsessed with physical appearance. <laughs> Struggling with your weight, they call it anorexic. Can't figure out your figures of speech. So you're dyslexic to all the CEOs, managers, coordinators, those who sit in positions of powers and policy makers. Every day you fearlessly put on your cape and face this grim reality, tired of wanting to be safe so you became superwoman. I hope my petition penetrates me masses and you come to your senses because I dislike being the antagonist. But they continue to use a strong minded woman as a bad example for a lady. Bless it. Thank you so much. That was Miss Zakia. Thank you so much. What a raw and powerful session from Miss Zakia Gill. She is a student of the Cyprian College of Labor and Cooperative Studies. And she has definitely set the tone this evening for. These amazing women who we see on our screens here and another one who will be joining us. So without further ado, let me introduce our first panelist, Miss Assistant Commissioner of Police, Joanne Archie. She was enlisted in the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service on the 19th of April, 
1982. So she is just one month shy of 40 years of service. Congratulations. And Ms. Archie is the holder of a Bachelor of Laws degree with honors from the University of London. She also has an MA in Mass Communication from the University of Leicester and a diploma in Human Resource Management from Cipriani College of Labor and Cooperative Studies. She has worked in several departments of the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service, performed at the Criminal Investigations Department for 19 years, and she also headed the Criminal Investigations Department for the Southwestern Division for four years. Ms. Archie has also worked in the legal department of the TTPS and was the first public information officer in the TTPS. She also was the first female divisional commander and she supervised the Tobago Division for three and a half years. She was awarded over 23 service commendations, ranging from bravery to commitment to duty, and was also awarded for excellence in policing by the National Security Officers Foundation for Excellence in Policing. Ms. Archie possesses a wealth of experience in policing and is an adjunct lecturer at the Police Academy where she lectures on public speaking and media relations. It is my pleasure to welcome you to the panel today. Um, Ms. Joanne, I'll just let you all know that um, as women today, we are on a first name basis. So we'll be engaging each other as such. So Joanne, I invite you now to share with us, what does International Women's Day mean to you? Anna? A pleasant evening to everyone. And let me first say it is indeed my pleasure to be a part of this forum, I would not have passed it up, especially to deal with women. And as um, when we discuss and celebrate women and their successes around the world, it ignites a passion in me because as a woman police and as a part of an organization that what, we, as we would say is male dominated, I have a lot to and the women police, women in law enforcement around will have a lot to celebrate. Since we were enlisted in the police service in 1955, where 12 women were enlisted in the organization, we've come a long way to a number of 3,000. And women are celebrated and are make up uh, several of the sections and units in the TTPS, something that was never heard of. So we have a lot to celebrate. In addition to that, it's, it's 1,882 our regular police officers, 22 female officers in the first division. That's a celebration that something that is not really heard of. It's the first in the organization since 1955. And as a female, I also celebrate women in different, different agencies, uh, military and paramilitary agencies, and International Women's Day. That's what it means to me, celebrating our women in every section, especially the TTPS, section, branch, 32 sections and branches in the TTPS, we are now represented in all. So we celebrated this year International Women's Day. And in fact, we were honored by our male counterparts for this year, for the, 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 uh, they appreciated our input into the organization and building the organization. So it means a lot to me to see where we have come from and where we are now. Thank you so much, Joanne. I mean, those are impressive numbers, going from 12 to 3,000 and being in every branch. That really is, uh, speaks, it speaks well of what has happened and where we're going. Let me introduce now another panelist. We have Shannon Hutchinson. Shannon is a Trinidadian-born airline pilot and author and an award-winning artist. She has over 20 years experience in both aviation and in the professional art world, and is an avid adventurer and traveler. She has submitted Kilimanjaro and trekked to the Everest base camp. That is no easy feat. She has four cats, one husband, and Shannon, 
what this International Women's Day means to you. Welcome. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. And it's truly an honor to be a part of this amazing panel. Um, International Women's Day to me is a reaffirmation of the positive visibility of women, which doesn't deserve one day. It really should be every day. Um, but it is always, of course, a good reminder every year for us to empower or remind each other to empower each other. And I think that it's important that there's positive visibility of women, not just visibility of women, but that we support one another. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shannon. And I do agree, visibly supporting is very, very important because otherwise it is simply a talk show and that really doesn't advance our cause one bit. All right. And let me now introduce Miss Antonia Tika de Freitas. Welcome. Ms. Antonia is currently the president of TUTO, the Trinidad and Tobago Union, uh, Teachers Union. No, I'm forgetting a letter. Teachers Association. Unified Teachers Association. Unified, there we go. Unified Teachers Association. Thank you so much. She is the first vice president of the Caribbean Union of Teachers. And Antonia has been an educator for the past 34 years. She became the president of TUTO in 2019, the first female president in the union's history. Congratulations. And with a background in human resource management and government studies, Antonia believes that leaders should facilitate opportunities and promote actions that emphasize individual empowerment and development of human capital. She has unhesitatingly advocated for the provision of quality education as a public good and provided, or as a public good, provided by qualified educated professionals. And as the first vice president of the Caribbean Union of Teachers, she has represented local and regional education professionals at various Caribbean and international forums. Tonya, welcome. And do let us know what International Women's Day means to you. Good afternoon, Yemi. Good afternoon to my um, other panelists. And it is de indeed an honor to be here, a privilege to be here this afternoon. Um, International Women's Day is, as was said, an opportunity for us to lend visible support to women, but more so for those of us who have the ears of various sectors, sorry, to advocate for legislative and policy reform where we possibly can. And in that regard, I would want us to consider that Trinidad and Tobago needs to ratify ILO Convention 190 that prevents a discrimination in the workplace, violence in the workplace against women. Um, we've signed on to the convention, but we have not ratified it. And therefore, the law, I see um, the SPRG shaking her head. Therefore, the laws required to enact that and to prevent violence against women, gender-based violence in the workplace. Those are, are things that we are waiting on. So International Women's Day gives us the opportunity to signal to legislators and policymakers, hey, wake up, get this thing going so we can protect our women and change that bias and that discrimination that exists. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Antonia. That is extremely important. And as you say, if we don't enact the policies, how do we have real change taking place? So I would let all of our audience know at this point that we do have another panelist who will be joining us at around 6.30. She is another amazing woman. Her name is Judaline Cassidy. She is a plumber based in the US and she has broken a lot of ground on having women become more visible and more drawn to trade. So when she does join us at 6.30, I'll give her full introduction at that time. So at this point, I just want to let those viewers who have joined us in the last 20 minutes uh, to say welcome again. You are listening to a forum that is specifically for the International Women's Day, the webinar that is being hosted by the Elma Francois Institute for Research and Debate, which is part of the Cipriani College of Labor and Cooperative Studies. Our theme today is taking action against the bias. And these wonderful women here with me have all broken 
the ceiling in their various careers. So we would start our discussion. I would invite you to share some of the barriers that you face as a woman in your career and talk to us about how we overcome them. I would invite us to start with Joanne. And Joanne, if you could unmute your mic for us. Okay. I'm sorry. There we go. Okay, I enlisted in the organization in 1982. And at that time, when I decided to become a police officer, I often said, and I did at that time, that I will become the first female commissioner of police. That was my vision. However, when I was first written up for my first promotion to the rank of corporal, I was told after I had been handed a notice that I am going up for promotion, I was told sometime after that I was too young and I had to wait. At that time, and I had um, qualified myself, I had passed my exams and I was quite in line with even at that age, um, three years, three, sorry, 10 years in the TTPS at the time, and which was adequate time that I should have moved to the next rank. I was told I was too young. And at that time in the organization, whenever you saw a promotion list, you could have identified how many women were on that list. You, you can see, identify two or three women on the list. So what is happening now, as I said before, it's a lot for me to celebrate because on a promotion list now, you will see, you, you can read all the, almost to the top of the list, the women coming down. So, so I mean, let the world know Trinidad and Tobago Police Service has removed some of those barriers that were there when I was a young constable since it took me 22 years before I could have gotten my first promotion. And which was unfair to me because I qualified after three years. So that was the first barrier that I had and then there were sections within the organization where women were not enlisted. I cannot say so, so now, but those were my personal experiences coming up in the ranks in the TTPS. It was not an easy journey because at that time as well, we, there was not as much an awareness for women in law enforcement and we had to, to rally or lobby for um, policies to be put in place. Um, example, sex and harassment policy, which we now have, and other um, policies that will give us, you know, women in the organization, equal opportunities for training. So those were some of the experiences I've had. And I promised, having gone through that, that with younger women police coming under me, I would do my best as I move through the ranks to ensure that they don't suffer the same fate. Wonderful, thank you. And once we hear from the other ladies, I'm going to circle back to ask you a bit about how you dealt with 22 years, you said, before you got your promotion. That is, that is, that's deep. So we, we can chat some more about that aspect of your journey. I would invite Shannon to tell us a little bit about some of the barriers that you faced in the airline industry. I'm always challenged to be better. And it's perhaps it's not something that I have to do, but it is certainly something that I feel like I must do. Like I must be better than my peers because people are always watching me. And because I'm, I'm, I'm very visible, you know, people are always looking at me, uh, whether I'm, I'm going through the airport or I'm in training and I'm one, um, I'm the only female in a classroom of, of men. And um, 
I'll I'll never forget. It's a it's a story that I've not told in in interviews before. Um, but many years ago, and when I first joined as a first officer, my airline, um, I was up for promotion. As we as we're talking about promotions, uh, onto another fleet. I was on turboprop and onto the seven three seven fleet, and strangely, about one person above me, because in the aviation industry, similar to um, in the police, I'm sure it's so it's seniority based. They started interviewing um, people for the upgrade, which on as a first officer is un, was unusual. Um, and they just started interviewing people, just one above me. And I was passed up for the promotion. And I was told, and I'll say allegedly, that it was because I had gotten engaged and I was getting married and they thought that I might be moving. And I, so I did leave. And it's obviously something that I don't ever want anybody to have to go through. And it is not something that women in other countries would have to go through. Um, but, you know, just, just to be completely honest, and I, I'm not with the airline anymore, um, but it's certainly a story that isn't isn't uncommon. But it's probably something that you don't you don't hear you won't hear a lot about because there's you know. <laughs> All right, and have you have you noticed in the last? Because I'm assuming this was some time ago. Many years. Ago. Many. So has has that shifted? Have you noticed a change in the attitude? Yeah. Yeah, so I did leave. Yeah, that was many years, about 10 or more years ago. I did rejoin Caribbean Airlines and um, and I was promoted. I went through, I started at the at the bottom of the seniority list um, and I, I was promoted. I didn't have to do an interview again. And um, and yeah, I things, of course, they changed. It was 10 or more years ago. Um, and I... I, I think I'm more confident now as well. I, I, I know I deserve the seat that I, that I was in every day that I went to fly. And, and I knew that I was bright because I worked hard because I always felt that I needed to be better or to do better. And it's one of those jobs where you never stop learning. And um, yeah, yes, there are, there are definite difficulties. You know, you are you know that you're not one of the boys, and and that's perfectly okay. And it's something that you sh you as a woman, you need to be secure with who you are, and in that you deserve the position that you have. Excellent. Thank you very much. And now I invite uh, Antonia to share with us some of the barriers that you have faced in the education system. To be honest, Yeni, I did not face significant barriers as a woman because I taught at an all-girls school where the staff would have been all-female. Um, so yes, your usual little interpersonal conflicts at that level. But I really and truly understood the concept of barriers to women um, and their upward mobility when I became the president of tutor. There were, and there still are, pockets of misogynistic behavior by the men, you know, well, I could, a woman could do that. And of course, a young woman could do that because I'm, I'm not in the old group. And that, of course, is something I've had to overcome. But the other thing or the other barrier I would say I have faced and I'm learning to deal with is that from the public. Because as president of tutor, let me, if I could just give a, a quick example, a quick comparison. When Joanne speaks, she speaks with the authority of an organization that people think as being legitimate and they tell themselves they acknowledge that the message she's bringing comes from the organization because we have allowed ourselves to be um, protected by the organization. When the tutor president speaks, she doesn't bring her individual message. She brings the message of the members into the public domain. And unfortunately, there are members of the public who don't want to hear the message we are bringing, obviously. You know, um, so you resort to shooting the messenger. And, and that's where we start to face a challenge. So over the last two and a half years, I have received the death threats. I have received the hateful emails and messages and so forth from members of the public. Um, I've been described because I, I sometimes 
puts on my serious face. I have been described as being a heavy drinker. And I take drugs and I am bitter cassava simply because they don't want to hear the message. And generally, traditionally, the message has been brought by a man. Now that the message is being brought by a woman, you don't want to hear it and you operate in that way. And so you block, you put the barricade up. But for me, like I said, navigating that, and I'm going to take my teacher moment now, I have three things that I do or three perspectives. All of those barriers, whether it's through policy and procedure, as my peers have outlined, or simply through perspectives, all of those barriers are artificial. And we as women, because we are so creative, we know we have to find ways around them, and we have found ways around them one way or the other. So we tend to overcome the barriers in our spaces. As Shannon said, the other way to overcome those barriers, and Joanne proved it, is to have confidence in yourself. Don't let anybody cause you to doubt who you are. If you do that continuously, you will always say, well, I can't overcome this, I can't do this. Barriers are artificial. I have the capacity to overcome it. And the third thing I do, or I have done to, to deal with it, there are women who've been through this before. Rosa Parks, Elma Francois, Daisy Crick of OWTU. There are women who've been through this before. And therefore, we look to the ancestors. We look to those women who've lived this. And we take the lessons that they have learned and they have shared with us. And we apply them to our lives and our scenarios. So for me, I don't think about barriers anymore. I think that we just need to see them. I am the glass half full kind of girl. We need to see it as an opportunity to grow ourselves and empower others. Thank you. That resonates so loudly with me. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. Because one of the things I look forward to in chatting with all of you and you know, sharing with our audience here is not just looking at this is a problem or this is a situation, but how do we move forward? And definitely understanding that uh, some barriers are artificial, you work hard, maintain confidence in yourself and absolutely love looking at um, looking towards the ancestors for guidance in moving forward. But as um, I pointed out earlier, let me ask you, Joanne, dealing with no promotion in 22 years, tell us about that reality and what kept you going? I think it was love for the profession. I love my job with a passion. And I think when I came upon, as Antonio mentioned, the issues of misogynism, because you will get that, because in the workplace you have to deal with different personalities. So I would not say by and large it was the organization that, that, that's like that because it's male dominated. I deal with personalities on its own. So there were few persons in between. And um, unfortunately, well, I, I ignore them. And I focus on what I wanted to be. I had a vision. I studied and prepared myself for upward mobility in the TTPS. And, and fortunate for me, at that time, when I, I passed out of the police academy in 1982, I was sent to work in Southern Division. I am from South, and so it was like home. And I was fortunate, as I tell my younger women police, I was very fortunate to meet the men, some of the men who were very cooperative and supportive, and whom I could have benefited from their experience in the TTPS. So I learned my work. I, I put emphasis on knowledge of the profession since I believe that is where my respect would come from and not any position given would be a token position because I'm a female. It must be that I earn my way there and you see me. I don't want you to see me as one of the boys, but I want you to see me for who I am and what I bring to the organization. 
and 22 years for the 20, and, and I mentioned the number of commendations that I would have gotten there. It was in those early stages of my career when the, the issue of promotion left me, but I know what I wanted and they entrusted in me certain responsibilities and I delivered to the best of my ability. As I said, I was fortunate to have supervisors who believed in me, saw me for who I am and not one of the boys, and they supported me. Now that I, I had that support, I pass on to my younger police officers, both male and female. So staying steadfast, and, and I'm still here almost 41 years, it's because of the support I got both from the public fellow female officers and the male officers as well. Well done, well done. And that is so important. I'll, I will share with you all a little story. We actually did a test run for this webinar earlier this week, and both Shannon and Antonia were present for that. And one of the things that stayed with me, ladies, is Shannon is an artist, an accomplished artist. And Antonia supports art. And as soon as Antonia heard that Shannon is an artist, she said, I want to see your work because I purchased. And that, that stayed with me, ladies, because I said that is an example of being real, supporting. It's not just lip service, but this is something that you have a passion about and you are prepared to put your money where your mouth is in terms of supporting. And that support really is something that all of us benefit from. And if we learn that lesson and support others, it helps move our cause forward. So if we bring forward, let me ask Shannon now, we have another question. Uh, why is it important to eliminate and address discrimination at the workplace? And how far do you think we have come in addressing the issue in your case in the airline industry? Well, I just want to go back to the point that Joanne made, which is that we're not, we're not one of the boys. So when we enter a male-dominated industry, the point is not to fit yourself in or jam yourself in as one of the boys. And it's something that I always like to say is that you, it is better to be a first-class woman than a second-class man. Uh, you're not you, You're not in the boys' club and you never will be. So just show up as the best person and woman that you can be in your industry. And she made another very good point that the, the industries that we are in, while they're male dominated, they are not the root cause of misogyny or sexual discrimination in the workforce. It's actually personalities that we deal with. And it, it, oftentimes it's certainly just only a, my, a minority of folks that you deal with that end up making um, the career paths that we've we've taken difficult. Not every day, but some days. <laughs> um, and so, and I and I apologize. Is now I've <laughs> I've forgotten. <laughs> you've asked me. Oh, that, that, that <laughs> is quite, quite alright. Sad because it was such a good point. Yes, I I agree with you, and I'm so happy you picked that up because you know as we discuss different aspects of the journey will impact on us. And definitely not being part of the boys club is very important, as well as understanding the role that personalities play when it comes to issues of bias. So I, the question I asked talked about um, discrimination in the workplace. So why is it important to eliminate and address discrimination in the workplace? Well, it's important to address discrimination because if it's happening to you, it's happening to others. And it's something that I've thought about a lot, especially as I've been in the aviation industry for the better part of the last 10 years, is that if something is happening to me, it's probably happening to others. And there's a lot of silence because you don't want to be discriminated against any more than you're already experiencing. 
So it's very important for women to talk to each other and um, to find allies, male allies in your workforce that understand and will listen and, and treat you as an as an equal. We're not equal, we're women, and you should show up as a woman, but that will treat you fairly in the workplace. And something that I mentioned much earlier, uh, a way to get around that is to show up as a, a, a positive influence and to keep talking about what's happening. Because silence is, while silence is something that is, I don't want to say encouraged, but it's encouraged by repercussions of speaking up as a woman in a male-dominated industry. It's something that can certainly prevent um, being discriminated against in the future. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you for sharing that. And I would ask Antonia to share with us your views on why it's important to eliminate and address discrimination. There, there is a, a perspective, Yemi, that I share to some extent, that discrimination is about power. Um, it's about a power relationship. I can do what I want because I have the capacity. I have the wherewithal. I just have the, you know, I'm able to do it. And therefore, whether we talk about discrimination in terms of gender-based discrimination, in terms of access to jobs, access to equal pay, access to, to help for unpaid work, you know, having that unpaid work paid for or considered, um, or even the sexual exploitation of women's bodies. Discrimination is about a power relationship. And therefore, to my mind, there are those who suggest that you had discrimination and you had gender mainstreaming and women fighting against that from as far back as the 1930s, when you had those women in Trinidad and Tobago who were part of the, the riots, the water riots, the East Indian women who were part of the water riots, when you had those women who were part of the hunger marches and the butler riots, they were fighting against discrimination then for basic human rights and conditions, right, and for jobs. Nowadays, discrimination, to my mind, is fueled by capitalism and the individualistic perspective of globalization. So there's a greater worldview that surrounds discrimination now. And therefore, to break down the barriers against that means that in the first instance, as women, as individuals, we have to find ourselves in that power relationship, which is why I agree with Shannon. You show up as the best version of a woman that you can be. Forget about being in the boys' club and trying to fit in. Forget about even trying to fit in with a woman, not because you want to separate yourself from their perspectives. You are you. Whether you're in the leadership role or you're in a, a lower level rank and file role, you are you. You have a role and you bring that out. You do what you have to do. And that is what people will remember about you. And what I am seeing now is that from those 1930s to the 1970s decades, that fight led by the woman. 1970s, we had people like Josanne Leonard as a student bringing out advocacy for women and women's rights and civil rights. Why have we lost that drive and that voice? Because of capitalization. And of course, it's all about individualism now. So what we need to perhaps do is change our perspective again. Encourage a change of perspective. Encourage a, a dialogue. And for me, I like the Eve principle. I don't mean for us to be like Eve, not at all. To me, and what I try to do with Intuita, when I encourage women and men, but I encourage women to share and come to meetings, because one of the things we've heard over the years is that women tend to step back from participation in union because, oh gosh, I have to go home and cook, wash, clean, my child, do whatever, and I don't have time. And so our voices are not heard and discrimination persists in the workplace and in the environment. The Eve principle, if each one of us here and the people listening educate women, show them a vision of what discrimination, eliminating discrimination looks like, and empower women, continue to inspire them. If we use the Eve principle on a continuous basis, then you will see women being willing to fight barriers, 
and discrimination change. I don't think we have come very far as a society in any sector because we will each have our individual examples as we are citing this evening. But there are many, many women. And we saw it during the pandemic, especially in women who, women who were in sectors that were informal or where they were not unionized, unfortunately. They lost their jobs first and last out, that kind of thing. But we have in Trinidad and Tobago signed on, and I'm going back to legislation as a unionist, I will, Maternity Protection Act, for example. That's to prevent discrimination simply because you can become pregnant. And you would not believe that there are employers who still send home women because they are pregnant or deny them access to maternity leave or time off of maternity visits, visits to the doctor, et cetera, prenatal visits. These kinds of discrimination or discriminatory actions are facilitated because we don't make an effort to investigate, and I'm not necessarily talking about investigate by the police, but the relevant authorities to investigate when they are reported and to follow up on enactment of the legislation. So in a way, in society, we are all culpable because we don't follow through with enactment. And we have to change that culture to one where if something comes to our, our attention in terms of discrimination, not only advocacy, not only marching against it or talking about it, but we use the legislation that we have and we call for what has to be ratified to change the discriminatory tactics. So I think we have a lot of work to do as Trinidad and Tobago in that regard to mitigate situations of discrimination in our different workspaces. Thank you. Thank you. And very powerful at using the legislation that exists, educating people, encouraging people to take action and come forward. All, all very, very um, powerful tools to effect change as we move forward. Um, before I ask Joanne to speak on the topic, we do have a question in from a viewer that is linked to what is taking place. Do you think discrimination also happens because the members of the boys club have an expectation that the other boys will support them? If any of you have, all right. So maybe we can start with Joanne and then each of you can address the topic. And um, of course, because there are still men who hold the stereotypical view that the woman places in the home, in the kitchen and the bedroom. And um, there are attempts, even now in my organization, and I will say with the less experienced ones, that they believe they can get the support. But because of the fact that as women police in the organization, we have held strong our ideas and our views as it relates to equality in the organization. So that if, if there's a little pocket of it um, pairing the head up, we deal with it firsthand. So that there, may, there will be attempts, and there were attempts, but um, because, again, it's, it, it is also how some men are socialized as well, and they come into the organization with some of these, you know, ideas in their head that um, this is how it's supposed to be. But they are subtly reminded that if this organization was like that some years ago, welcome to the TTPS in 2022. So yes, and I, I, I speak broadly, not only for the TTPS, men, some of them like children, they will try, they will try things and they will get what they can get away with, they will. But um, as Antonia said, we need to be stronger as women together. And whilst every year we come together and we celebrate, and we say we celebrate an International Women's Day, what exactly are we celebrating? Because we still have women and young girls around the world who are in inequality in, in, in areas and countries around the world in job spaces. So yes, we have celebrated, yes, we have made some strides and according to Antonia, but we have a long way to go. We need to continue to lobby the legislators to have to ensure that we secure our space as women in the world. Well said, well said. Um, 
well said. And so both Shannon and Antonia shaking their heads. So maybe Shannon, if you'd want to comment at this time, and then Antonia. Yeah, I just want to jump off on what both Antonia and Joanne were saying. Um, Antonia made a really great point that we need to lead uh, by example. And um, <laughs> sorry, we need to lead by example. So younger women can't be looking at me, you know, 10 or more years into my aviation and art career or 20 years into both careers and see me still being as intimidated as I was when I first joined because that's where they are and they need to be able to look up to us and see well no I deserve to be here and um, of, yes legislation is important but there's also an acknowledgement or, or we need to acknowledge that there's a bit of a cultural um, sexual there's sexual discrimination in, in, in part of our culture you know I, I I would go to the airport every day and a lot of the discrimination I would get actually were from passengers. And unfortunately, most of them were women, you know? So I think that people need to reimagine where our women need to be and where we deserve to be and look at how, how far women have come in, in Trinidad and in the world and how much further we have to go because there's still so much further that we have to go <laughs> that is that is excellent and it's interesting that you spoke about people at the airport uh discriminating or passing judgment and i noted when antonio was speaking that a lot of the pushback came from members of the public now i don't want us to lose that point but before we discuss that if you wanted to say something Antonia about the boys club and the perception yes and, and, and well the question was basically about you know the expectation of men supporting and I have a perfect example for that because it's a real life experience for me the TTPS has an, an ad out about male groom, grooming of young women yes and there are two gentlemen um, one has one is giving tips for how to groom a young lady. And the message is that is not something acceptable. That's not something we're going to support. And I remember being in, in a space where there were young, two young men discussing that. And rather than see the intended message of the ads, this was like, boy, you know, we have your back, you know, don't worry. And, and, and therefore, the expectation is real. And we create opportunities to fight the discrimination and to send one message. But again, as Joanne said, because of the socialization, because this was a particular space in a particular environment, because of the socialization, we get a different message. And there is the expectation. I have your back. Let me go ahead. Go ahead with it. You know, we, we go help you. We go help you tame them because it's about control. So I just want to say it is real. Yes, we are working to avert it, but we can't bury our heads in the sun. We have to make sure our message continues to go consistently. Thank you. Thank you so much. And maybe at this point, we can actually talk about this aspect of it. And I would, I would caption it by saying public perception and culture. What would it take? You know, because we're talking about fighting against or taking action against the bias. What can be done? What are ways in our work situation that we can start shifting this public perception? We've, we've heard of the negativity with the airline, negativity with members of the public and tutor. Uh, Joanne, any examples with the police force, what women face and what are some of the things that have been done to change, shift this perception? I want to understand the question, the perception again. Yes, the perception. We've had two descriptives of, in some cases, women showing bias. We've had death threats for Antonio. We've had persons in the airport. So culturally, we have issues of discrimination that are based in our culture. And have you seen that? 
what steps can we take to shine a light on that and start transforming that public opinion when it comes to women's well um from a law enforcement perspective we understand what women go through in society and i mean we read about it every day the domestic violence gender-based violence even against young children and the previous commissioner of police under his tenure, he instituted the gender-based violence unit headed by Miss Claire Guy Allen. What we saw happening is that um, people felt more comfortable to come forward because in the past you would hear that um, members of the public would complain that when they go to the police stations, police officers will make fun of the reports or they will say husband and wife business and things like that. So we understand that there was a need to um, address reports against women, violence against women differently. And we trained our officers, both male and female, to address those reports. In fact, we are now under the umbrella of the Special Victims Unit, where we have the Gender-Based Violence Unit, we have the Child Protection Unit, and a Sexual Offenses Unit as well. What we try to do by our PSAs Public Service Announcement is to, we, we had those PSAs going out, you know, to, to advise members of the public how they should treat their women, how they should treat reports, um, violence against women, children, even reports of rape. And um, you would see, even on social media, when some of these um, PSAs are placed out, the comments coming from men. And um, so you ask yourself whether we are ready. As a society, how we treat our women. 2022, we celebrated women. Every year, the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service, the Women Police, we celebrate with um, International Women's Day. But this year, our policemen said, the commissioner of police and our male officers said, we will be honoring our female officers. What did they, they send a clear message to the public that we tell you by our crime prevention ads, how you should treat women. Don't do this and don't do that. And we are leading by example. Our women in the organization, we appreciate them. And we will be celebrating and honoring our women for 2022 to lead the way so that the public will understand women have their roles and women should be respected and seen as equal. So, I mean, it, it was a day of fun for us. We were honored by a, a semi-military parade in front of the um, police headquarters where a guard of honor was formed by our men as we marched through and then awaiting on the doorsteps of the police headquarters were the first division men, um, ACPs, who escorted us one by one to, out, to upstairs to the reception area where we were serenaded. We were um, served lunch by the men and we were awarded um, certain plaques, and that's to show appreciation for what we bring to the organization. That was so heartwarming for me. In my 40 years, it has never happened, even though I still felt appreciated at times, but that is what celebrating International Women's Day was for us in the TTPS. That is really, really heartening to hear because I did see uh, video footage of the parade and I saw all the women on horses, but I didn't know the longer story, the back story. So that is, that is absolutely brilliant because it does lead us into the, the question of moving forward, you know, in the workplace. What advice can we give women who are challenged? What can be done? So in this instance, we saw men taking the lead. And we did discuss that a bit earlier. They need to have male allies as we move forward in terms of changing discrimination and bias. So let me invite us now to take a look at that question a little more. We did speak on it a bit. But as women who have broken the bias and now hold jobs or positions that are typically or traditionally held by men, 
What additional advice, because you have given some already, would you give women who are challenged in a male-dominated industry? We can start with Shannon. Well, advice that I that I always give, and it, it was something that I mentioned previously, is just to show up as a woman. When you are entering a male-dominated field, you're not required to be a man. <laughs> you're, not, you're not a man, and, and you're not one of the boys, and you, you don't need to show up as one of them. You're a woman, and you show up as the best woman that you can be, and that's how you can show up as the best person and employee that you can be. Um, that, that's the best advice I can give any woman coming into aviation or any male-dominated field. Excellent. Thank you. And one of the things I've learned over time is good messages bear repeating multiple times. So if we say that five more times in the next hour, that works. Um, Antonia, you, you have provided quite a number of tips so far in terms of moving forward, not... Um, not getting stuck with the idea that uh, discrimination is real, it's artificial. You said you spoke of having confidence in yourself as well as looking to our ancestors as role models. But are there any other bits of advice you may want to give um, younger persons who feel challenged in a male-dominated industry? You know, Yami, um, colleagues, I have two daughters, two stepdaughters, all adults. And I am so proud of these young women. I'm also proud of my son and the way he treats his partner because it's about respect, making sure that who you are, you hold true to that. And so the first thing I would want to say is breaking the glass ceiling, breaking the bias and reaching where you are. It's a small part of it, you know. You know what the bigger picture must always be, what your bigger focus must always be? Your legacy. What will people remember of you? They will in yes, you have the naysayers, but those will go. People will not remember that. They will remember you for who you are, whatever you did, big or small, what if you deem it significant or insignificant, they will be the judge of that. They will remember your legacy. And so I, for me, always remember what my father would have said to me growing up. Um, two things, basically. One, Never let any man disrespect you. You've never seen me disrespect your mother. Um, my son has not, will not be disrespecting his, his partner. And my daughters know what we, what, you know, what kind of man they would want to become engaged in event, and eventually. So your legacy, one, has to be a personal one in the first instance. Demonstrating who you are and being consistent with that. If people call your name, yes. She's associated with honesty. She's associated with integrity, with loyalty, with whatever trait, with speaking her mind, right? And um, being frank, being fearless. That's your personal legacy. You build that and you build that and you take that through your life. Be consistent with it. I, I look at Joanne on TV all the time and I'm like, I want to be like her when I grow up simply because she has that aura of authority and the way she carries herself. Yes, the message may not be her own, but we know her to be consistent in terms of her attitude, right? So your legacy in the first instance is a personal one. Then there's your legacy as a professional, whatever area, regardless of the job or task. The second bit of advice, do it to the best of your ability regardless of what it is, so that consistently, again, people will associate that with your name. And therefore, it's not just, as I said, about breaking the bias and accomplishing, but demonstrating why you deserve to be there, or you deserve to have that job, or you deserve the acknowledgement. And like I said, you don't always have to be somebody in the public space. Wherever you are, you bring the best of it. So don't be about compromises for the wrong reasons. We've spoken about that already. Don't be about taking on people who speak ill of you and try to bring you down. That's part of life. Grow up. Get a backbone. Be thick, become thick-skinned. I'll say that too. Because they tell themselves women will run in a corner and cry on you, know? 
No. When you look at every woman in the Bible, and I'm using the Bible because I'm a Roman Catholic, when you look at every woman in the Bible, so spoken or not, one word, fearless. Fearless. And so breaking the bias, yes, but for you to take action against the violence, you must know who you are, what your legacy will be, and what you want people to remember you for. Thank you. Excellent, excellent. Well said, well said. I do, I do love it and I absolutely agree because taking action is how we make change going forward. So let me invite um, Joanne maybe to share any additional advice on women um, who feel challenged in a male dominated? Antonia, um, you handle yourself well. I look at you as well on the television. And you make your point, you stick to your point, and you, you, I mean, it's a pleasure. You are a pleasure to listen to, and um, I commend you as well as a representative for the union for the um, that body you represent there. As a female officer, and I will come back to my organization. What I would advise young women. Sometimes as leaders, and generally as leaders, there may be a pressure to conform to the male leadership model, to fit in, to be accepted. And we see it from time to time. You know, you, you, you follow certain male leaders and you want to be like that person. Um, you may want to display that tough exterior, but not necessarily so. What we bring, and I advise women in challenge, what we bring to organizations is unique. Woman has that natural ability to take people from a room of fear to a room of hope. And according to the young people, we good like that. God has taken a unique path for everyone, but woman has that natural quality to express compassion passion and care. These qualities work well in crisis. And that's when you see women come forward in crisis situation. So we need not try to be like the man or to fit into a perfect leadership model, male role. What advice I will also give women within challenges, challenges situation. Richard Branson said, dream big. And if your dreams don't scare you, they are too small. Research, reach for the moon. And we've heard that, reach for the moon. And even if you fall short, you will still land among the stars. I started this program by saying that I had a vision to be the first female commissioner of police. I am already on my way out. I didn't reach that pinnacle. I fell short, but I'm an assistant commissioner of police after taking off the mark 22 years. So that um, you set your goals and you stay focused on the end goals. There may be many distractions as I have encountered but I knew what I wanted. I know where I wanted to go. And I took every opportunity for personal development as well. So I will advise persons and those challenge women in challenging position. Seize and embrace all opportunities for personal development and diversify your skill set. When you, you have knowledge. Knowledge is power. When you have knowledge of whatever profession that you choose, you will be respected for what you bring to the organization and not any token because she's a female. So let's give her that. You earn your way there. Excellent. Excellent advice. Um, I'm actually blown away listening to all of you. I feel a little fan. Actually, I uh, had the pleasure of encountering Joanne 
many, many years ago in 2009, I actually worked at the Secretariat for the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting back in the day. And even at that time, your power to inspire in terms of your direction and your leadership and your groundbreaking was evident. So fast forward now to 2022, and I'm seeing the evidence of your conviction and your determination to stand your ground and to make the best. And certainly the idea of personal development as a key, regardless what area you're in, that is so, so important. So, so important. And that takes us into another question that has popped up. If you all can share with us uh, from your different organizations, uh, interventions or programs that you all have been a part of or are aware of that has assisted in breaking the barriers. What sort of changes and programs have you seen or been a part of over the course of the years? Maybe you can start with Shannon, anything in the aviation industry there? Programs that have helped break the, any barriers in, in yes, my industry? Sure that change, um, any programs that have helped change the status quo, as it were, for women in the industry? Does that help with the question? I, I, can't, I can't say that there are any programs that help with any changes in the industry in terms of breaking the bias for women in the industry. Um, in in Trinidad, anyway, I do know that there are women's um, associations, pilot associations abroad. Um, one, uh, I I love my union. My union takes good care of us anytime that we do have any issues, and I'm a strong union girl. <laughs> but aside aside from that, no, and unfortunately, not really. I make up. Um, women make up only 7% of the airline industry. So, th th no, there, there are no programs. Um, I've been honored to be a part of several other programs outside of my industry that empower women. Um, but in terms of the avi aviation industry, no. I, I suppose I, I enjoy doing solo things. People do reach out to me on social media and I I can't tell you the number of women and, and men that I've encouraged to go to flight school that have written me that did, or there there are some people that are with a with the airline now that I remember encouraging very many years ago. And it, it's not um my focus is on empowering everybody, not not just women only, you know. Absolutely, absolutely important. And you, you got me curious there um, with the organizations that are not necessarily part of the aviation industry. If you can share a little bit about that, what it might do is spark an idea that might start something here. Who knows? But can you talk well, about that? Well, I was, um, well, I am one of the Forte and the Forte influencers with the Ministry of Sport and Youth Affairs. I believe the ministry is called something else now, but that was a really lovely program. Um, many of us in Forte and the Forte influencers went to different schools uh, pre-pandemic, and it was really lovely. You could see how the program really touched the lives of the students in the different schools that we visited. Um, and again, it was about empowering people, not just women. Of course, it's it's really good and healthy and important for young girls in the schools that I visited or the young women that reach out to me to see a strong, confident woman in a male-dominated industry. But it's just as important for men to see a strong woman in a male-dominated industry as well and to empower them, whether it is to, to join the industry that I'm in or to follow their dreams and join the industry that they're, they're interested in. Um, that, that, that was an important one. There were, there were several others, but, but mostly I would do a lot of, on my own, I would be asked um, to speak at different schools or different facilities. And it, it was always an honor. I, I, children are, are the future, so. Wonderful, thank you so much. Thank you so much. And let me ask Antonia, are you aware or have participated in any programs that have helped move forward 
the agenda of equality. Well, before I get into that, I just want to go back to something Shana said about working in her environment. I remember years ago when there was the flurry of newspaper articles about this first female pilot in Trinidad and Tobago. I was very impressed. I said, oh, look at her, good for her kind of thing. However, the first year that I traveled when she was a pilot, I was so darn excited. You know, I wanted to do like one of those little children and run up to the cabin and meet the captain. Here she was, here she was, you know, um, because it was simply because this young woman who dared to follow a dream and she made it a reality. And I had the privilege of being on a flight that she was flying, you know, and, and I, I say that to say when we talk about interventions, we need to talk about networking. Many times, <clears throat> networking, we think about interventions in siloed environments. This group doing this, this entity doing that. Um, but we don't try to cross fertilize what we do. Sometimes there are obvious reasons, different philosophical approaches, agendas, etc. But interventions, especially once when we want to talk gender mainstreaming and removing bias, we need networking within as a classroom teacher. Um, I, again, girls or girls school, same thing about respect. Set your mind to the goals you want and let's see how you can achieve it. So, for example, as simple as it was, we would have in our schools career days. Many of us do that where we encourage our students or girls to, to vision and to enact those things. Um, as, as a leader within tutor, one of the things we've encouraged is to come out to the meetings, let your voice be heard. Just before I came in, we started a peer counseling program and it's continued where we provide emotional support. Um, we're the support of professionals from time to time to women who have been victims of abuse or you know, violence. Um, and the level of the joint trade union movement um, we started or we established a woman, Jatam's woman group, not because there was discrimination, but to allow us to reach out to our sisters in the work environment and lend them support against discriminatory practices. So those are some of the things that we have done. I would want to say that as well, very quickly, when I contested elections in 2019, um, there were three female candidates for presidency first time in tutor's history. Forgive me, those, those things are happening in the environment when you have virtual engagements. But additionally, that year, we had the largest number of female candidates contesting elections within tutor for all different positions. And I take that and I always tell my colleagues, when I leave as president, there must be endless women lined up behind to take my place because that was the do-all and end-all of that particular intervention. So as we do training, we always encourage our women to participate. Like I said, at JTM Women, we have our group that we do our outreach programs, our little activities, and we are trying to build on that within the unions to empower our women and help them to understand that they can work towards gender equality using the EVE principle, educate, vision, and empower. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much. Eve policy, educate, vision, empower. Did I get that right? Excellent. All right. And Joanne, are you able to share with us any programs that you may have been a part of or um, are aware of that would provide interventions for removing discrimination, changing bias? I can um, think of several sections in the TTPS that were predominantly male. And we are talking about the mounted and canine department, the guard and emergency branch, which um, they are called out, uh, what we call public order teams, the interagency task, task force, um, other sections within the TTPS where the staff there was solely male. What we did in the HR department to encourage and to show equality in the workplace, whenever we are recruiting, we also, it is thrown out for both male and female. So you find now that women are represented in almost 
all the sections we have in the TTPS where before, in years before, a, the, the male officers dominated those sections. And um, women, women have risen to the call. So you find you're seeing women on horseback, women on motorcycles, women on bicycles, because we have the bicycle unit in Tobago. Women photographers, fingerprint experts, crime scene experts. We are everywhere. And according to Michael Jackson's song, we just got to be there. So that we are represented, we have four the opportunities for women if they if they, they want to, to um crime scene expert and the training, overseas training as well, where we partner with several um NGOs with respect to offering training to the TTPS. Women are equal in that regard. They have an equal opportunity for training. And as a female officer, I encourage our women to, we are members of the International Association of Women Police, where each year women police congregate in different parts of the world, where we are exposed to training in contemporary policing issues and other type of train, types of training to equip us for leader, leadership role in the organization. So we encourage our women to join this organization and the, the organization also sponsors women to attend that conference. That conference will see thousands of women police from all over. So an equal opportunity is given. And as the, the executive, a member of the executive in the TTPS, where they're out of the 12 executive members, five are women, first time in the history of the police service. So as we are up there and our policy makers, we continue to review policies that will remove any form of bias for women police coming up in the organization. We are currently reviewing our um, sexual harassment policy and also our employee assistance program to facilitate women as well. Uh, just today, there our, our medical facility at St. James, where we offer, we are now offering pap smears to women and reviewing medical care for women at the facility. So um, we can shout it at the top of the mountain. The TTPS has gone a long way in showing equality for women in the organization. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. It's so important that we know and that we learn and that we understand because my next question for each of you looks at the future. Where would we like to see women as we move forward in our various industries? The TTPS clearly has been making huge strides, but where would we like to see women down the road, five years, 10 years? Anyone want to start with that vision? You know, Yami, um, just this year, the Caribbean Union of Teachers, the COT, passed its gender policy. And this COT is a significant organization, many years under its belt. But we, just in 2022, we passed a gender policy. And from that policy, um, different teachers unions around the region will now build out their own gender policies. And I think that's a good place for us to start as, as organizations, as, as Joanne has signaled. And I am sure Shannon will push it within her organization when she has the opportunity. Let us start with policies and frameworks, because as much as we thrive on goodwill and finding allies, policies and frameworks set the standards for us to operate, especially when we want to look at gender mainstreaming and gender equity. So it's not just about the standalone activities, it's about the policies that we have in place, both within our organizations and at the legislative level, the national level. But we also need, if we want to see women change direction for women change in the future, we have to change how we socialize our men one. So for example, when I did my president's message 
to members for International Women's Day after talking about all the things about women, I thank the men, just like Shannon did, for being the allies. I didn't go into the chicken and egg situation about who was better, that kind of thing. That's another debate. But I thank them for being the allies and the support because without them, we would not be able to accomplish. And we do know that, unfortunately, there are many women and girls who don't have such allies. So then we hear about the Big Brother movement, for example, in the US. In the future, maybe we in Trinidad and Tobago, in our little island state, need to start. Some of us may have started it a big system movement. But where we have the opportunity to do so and to sustain it, whether individually or collectively, let's do that. Let's reach out to somebody and empower them, right? Let's make sure we continuously reach out to our women and our girls who we tend to not want to look at when we see them on the streets, for example, and let's go up to them. Some, yes, I know it's, it's, it might be a scary proposition for some of us going up to that person, but that too is a, a form of discrimination against them. When we make a conscious decision that because of how they look, or how they smell, we will not reach out to them to try to lend some kind of support. So how we think about things, first the structure, the policy in our organization, the legislation, but also making a conscious decision to reach out and to engage both formally and informally, those are things we have to do if we want to see changes for our women in the future. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, Shana, any ideas? But let me let me just jump back a little bit before we talk about the future. We did have a question coming in from the panel. And the first one is, what can men do to help to achieve equality? We've, we've been speaking about that a bit, but what can men do to help to achieve that equality? Any one of you wants to start us off on that? Shannon, any ideas? What, what can, the question is, what can men do to help achieve equality? I see, I see Joelle, Joelle was going to start. So I'll let her start and then maybe I'll talk after Shannon. Well, firstly, um, men must understand who the female is, who is a woman, what, who is a woman and what she represents. Firstly, the understanding that you will understand because just how you were socialized or, you know, and, and, and how you address women generally, how you treat your mother, your sister, uh, relatives, your, your daughter. Understanding women and respecting what women bring to the table is important. And that's the first start. Don't see us as competitors baby makers or homemakers we are equal partners in marriage and we also are the mothers the sisters we do double roles and for if if, if to start anywhere from making a contribution to women is understanding these simple things and how you can so it's how you perceive the woman if it's your wife, would you treat your wife like this? So, so bring it to the workplace now. The woman, woman bring such a different value to the workplace that it is important to have in a fair and equitable workplace means taking advantage of the strengths of both genders and what they bring to the table. So a manager, male manager, see me, Joanne, as one of your equals, that just what you bring to the table, I bring, regardless of what gender I am, but I want you to respect me, not as one, as one of the boys, as I said before, but as female, Joanne Archie, and what value I bring to the table, just as you did. Excellent. Thank you. And before we go on to Shannon, I just want to welcome to our panel, Judalyn Cassidy, did I pronounce that name correctly? Judalyn. All right, yes, wonderful. Know. My name is Yemi. I'm the moderator this evening. As we announced earlier, you were unable to join us before, but let me make an official introduction for you, for our listening audience. Now, Judalyn Cassidy, for those of you who like me, have seen her on TV. 
He is a note of the soil of Trinidad and Tobago and is one of CNN's 2020 Champions for Change and the activist behind the trademark phrase, Jobs Don't Have Genders. Now, as a history-making plumber in New York City, Judalyn has broken countless barriers in fighting for equity for women in the construction trades for the last 25 years. And as the founder of the nonprofit Tools and Tiaras Inc., Judalyn is inspiring the next generation of tradeswomen through hands-on mentoring workshops and summer camps for girls aged 6 to 17. She is a role model, a captivating speaker, and the recipient of numerous awards and recognitions. Judalyn has been featured by many esteemed news organizations, including the Associated Press, CNN, and BBC America. So now that we've made you blush a little bit, yeah. <laughs> Judalyn, uh, welcome to our round table discussion, which is being held by the Elma Francois Institute. And your co-panelists, it would be Joanne Archie, I see you shaking your head, Assistant yes. Commissioner of Police. We have Antonia De Freitas, who is the president of the Trinidad and Tobago Unified Teachers Association, as well as the Caribbean, help me Antonia, let me, uh, Caribbean Vice Union President, of Teachers. Vice President of the Caribbean Union of Teachers. Teachers, as well as Shannon Hutchinson, who is our Trinidad-born airline pilot, author and award-winning artist. So we are knee deep in discussions about, um, we actually each got an opportunity to share some of the barriers that we have experienced. And, you know, I know, I know we're running down on time, but can you share a little bit with us about your history, your challenges and how you've been overcoming them over the last 25 years? Yeah, so definitely um, barriers. Every black woman <laughs> um, knows that there is a bunch of them. And, and being a black woman with an accent from the Caribbean is has, uh, has its challenges, even though a lot of people like it because it's musical. Um, it has, has its challenges. And being the first, sometimes when you're being the first, you don't know that you've taken the brunt of everything for everybody else. So that has been difficult uh, being on a construction site, being the first and only woman is really, really difficult. But I think the foundation that I had growing up in Trinidad and Tobago, attending um, Tranquility Primary School, Diego Martin Secondary, prepared me to the fact that we, I always had a model of how it is I am going to break through. If you fail to prepare, prepare to fail. That was one of them that was written up on our school board. And I just knew that I wasn't doing it particularly thinking I was baking barriers. I just wanted to prove that I can do it. So I you know people really can't see how tall I really am. I'm like four feet eleven and seven eighths, but I didn't see myself like that. Right? I didn't see myself like that. And I think all of those barriers of um, getting people to know and accept, especially men, that I love the craft just as much as them. I can do it just as much. I feel the passion just as much as them. I'm madly in love with plumbing still, just as mad as them. I still experience it. But I think what has helped me survive is the fact that I use humor a lot, and that has helped me. And then also standing up for myself, like, no, I'm not going to take that. And then the island girl come out and they know that I'm not playing. <laughs> so that's how the barriers that I have, um, uh, I had had some and, and overcome them using those things. Excellent. Our oh, other speakers spoke of um, understanding that barriers are artificial. Yes. Right? They spoke of having confidence in yourself always, not trying to come to the table as a boy or to be part of the boys club, but to bring the qualities that are unique to females to whatever industry you are a part of and seeking to help challenge. Um, our other speakers also spoke of relying on our ancestors, those who have gone before us in terms of uh, what they did to break barriers and struggles. Might you share with us a little bit about the organization that you started? Because we also had this part of the discussion. What are we doing to change and transform and take apart the barriers? 
Yeah, so, so tiaras. Yeah, so starting tools and tiaras um was I was actually wanting to do this for years, wanting to um if anybody listening, the actual amount of women in construction since 1970 has been 3%. It just went up to 4%. That's since 1970. So I love solving puzzles <laughs> and I wanted to figure out a way how can I fix this and be part of the change. And I knew that when I was a little girl my ambition was to be wonder woman and a lawyer and uh that didn't happen but I knew that how the trades empowered me and it has made me walk through every door every space all the time knowing that I got it I wanted to impart impart that onto girls. So I was asked to speak at the makers conference. It's like a conference they have usually uh, around this time. And in the speech I had said that I want to give a girl a tool and a tiara which is given a confidence, independence and power. And the minute I said that, universe said, that thing that you wanted to do for girls, you got to go do it. And I came back and I googled how to start a nonprofit how many board members you need that and for a long time i was funding it with my own salary but one of the amazing things which i'm glad that i listened to the voice and this is like serendipitous after i started the nonprofit incorporated all of that i sent an email to someone and she sent me back an email and she shortened it tnt tools and tiaras is actually tnt without even had plan in that so it's sometimes we don't realize that the the universe god allah whoever you believe in puts this all of us here for a purpose and if we don't follow it it's going to give be given to somebody else and like seeing shannon like we what we do at tools and tiaras we show girls women only women in all different fields they meet female police officers pilots we have a girl because we introduce her to people like Shannon she's going to be a pilot we introduce them to engineers um plumbers electricians every trade within the stem field to show them that truly their jobs don't have genders and we see in a lot of the girls actually stay in in those subjects in school that are mostly have boys in it because of the experience at tools and tiaras actually showing them visually that their plumber their pilot air the the even the female pilots that fix the, the pilots um the pilots and plus the the technicians that fix the plane um which i just go crazy i i get women everywhere this come on show me show my girls show the princess warriors what we can do and we can really change the world and i think the change starts with all of these amazing women here probably when they say with us so that the girls can do it and i truly believe that each one of us here on this panel was called to the particular job that you every one of us has so that it's not for us it's for someone else and that's what i truly believe Excellent. Thank you. And on that note, I would like to ask each one of you if you could talk to us about women who inspire you. Right? <laughs> so, uh um, maybe I can put Antonia to start us off, women who inspire you. I was one of those girls who wanted to be Wonder Woman as well. Uh I'll start with that. <laughs> But definitely um the 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 elder woman of my family um who different fields different backgrounds from um the the, doc, the nurse the the teacher the, the pastor those elder women were my inspiration my first trajectory my first track of listen this is how i have to live my life this is what i have to do so my mother my aunts i didn't know my grandmothers but my mother and my aunts held it down as we say through thick and thin you know one apple would serve 10 people and you would walk away with your belly full because frugality and sharing were principles you had to learn and then of course being real to who you were and being consistent i saw these women live this and as i became an educator um and i grew up there was the mother teresa and i saw the mother teresa approach in terms of servant leadership and that's what i try to do i try to serve my job is to serve 
the members of the union, the members of JTM, to serve the students. But that's what my job is. Mother Teresa was a servant. And that's, that's where I would have drawn my inspiration. Nowadays, you have people like Michelle Obama, etc. The women who are not afraid to speak their mind and to live their truths and to diversify their approaches to doing things. And from what Judalene just said, well, I just got a new inspiration as well. So, yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. All right, Shannon, who are the women who inspire you? A woman that's inspired me in this industry is the first female pilot with BWI, which was Wendy Yaoching. And Antoine, I know you've mentioned earlier that, that you thought that it might have been me because you and you were on my flight and you made me smile. I, I, I think I'm I'm very visible and um, and that's not by accident because I think that women need to see other strong women. And Wendy, I, I had the pleasure of meeting her several times and she's lovely. And I I was able to see what a strong and quietly confident woman and pilot she was. And it was truly inspiring. And it made it made me want to model the way I am in the industry after her. And I, I know that the only issue anyone ever had with her is that she stuck to the rules. And it's something that, it's actually something that um, I, I had heard about myself recently and I didn't take it. I took it as a compliment, you know. I think that as a woman, as I mentioned earlier, the expectation is that you... You, you know, that you're, you're the best that, or that or my expectation of myself is that I'm the best and the best that I can be. So Wendy Yaoching definitely, Captain Wendy Yaoching definitely. Um, I, had, I had some really wonderful and inspiring art professors as well and um, that encouraged me. And it's the reason that I put myself out there so much and do so many school talks and and this kind of thing, Judalyn, you're amazing in, in the few moments that we've listened to you speak. So I, I, I can go on, there's so many, um, and I think that it's wonderful to see in this day and age in 2020, the number of powerful women that young girls can model themselves after. Excellent, excellent, thank you. All right, and Joanne, who are some of the women who inspire you? Well, I will firstly have to start with my mother, my queen, the woman who has taught me all that I have, I know and I have become. I, my mother is such, she's still alive. She's very a strong woman, a single parent she was. And I recall when I was entering the police service, every Every process that I went through, exams, medical, interview, I was accompanied by my mother up to the date that I was going into the police academy with my as your grip, as you called it long ago. My mother was at the side of me. I'm doing exams. She's sitting in a corner waiting. And I was, I became known as the girl who used to come with her mother all the time, you know, so that um, I have a lot to thank her for for who I am, and I had some positive female um, persons in my life as well. You will recall the name Assistant Commissioner of Police, Margaret Sampson Brown. That's my cousin, my first cousin. I came from a family of mostly police officers, and also Senior Superintendent Pearl Bruce, deceased. Those are my relatives, positive women in my life, and as a very young girl, Margaret, when she was a constable, I looked at her and I said, listen, I want to be a police officer just like her. And she was my role model. And, and, and when I joined the police service, she also guided me. And, you know, so I had these two strong women, three, my mother first. And incidentally, both Margaret Sampson Brown and my other cousin, um, Senior Superintendent Pearl Bruce were national awardees. So um, positivity all the time. 
you know. So I must say these are the people who really, um, you know, did something and, and, and helped me, molded me into whom I, who I am now. So I want to say thank you, um, Margaret, and um, also my mother and deceased superintendent, Pearl Bruce. Those are strong, powerful women who really I followed. Excellent, excellent. We talked earlier about legacy, and I see where the legacy has come from. So, Judalyn, who are some of the women who have inspired you? I would say first and of all, my great great grandmother, because I didn't grow up with my mom. My mom um, had given me to my great grandmother, but she had believed in me without a shadow of a doubt. That she always told me that education would be my way out. She always told me when I didn't believe in myself that um, she believed in me, and she that she used to say that I was here for a great purpose. I didn't know it then, but I didn't believe her. <laughs> Now that I'm the feminist plumber, I, I kind of know it. But and also in general, in my life right now, even now from the, from being a little girl, I think I always looked up to women. I always felt that women are so much stronger than we give ourselves and what we believe that society says. So I think it, every time I, I surround myself with amazing, powerful women in my life and everything that has ever achieved is because a lot of women has surrounded me. There's a couple of brothers, but I would say the strength of women in general, when I see the things that they do um, just around the world, women and girls, they are my inspiration besides my great grandma mother just instilled in me that um we are from uh, we are from slaves um we need to to make sure that the next generation um we know that we are that we come from a great continent and she just kept saying those things so i always believe that women are warriors and that's what i consider myself to be a warrior excellent yeah, I mean, can I just comment on something that Judah Lynn said very, very quickly, very quickly. She used the word who you surround yourself with, and it ties in with what you're asking in terms of the inspiration. You know, in Trinidad, we have a saying, your friends will carry you, but they will not bring you back. Right. And then again, there's show me your friends, and I will show you who you are. Who you want to be as a woman is also influenced by, not by the, the, those the seniors, but by who you surround yourself with. Mm -hmm. And as we grow and we evolve and we try to live out things and navigate our lives and fulfill our dreams, break barriers, seek equality. Sometimes we have to change our circle. Plain, we have to say it plainly. Sometimes we have to change our circle so that the, the worldview, the mindset, the influences would be more in keeping of what we want to accomplish and more in keeping with building equality and building a network and supporting one another rather than just existing and riding the title. So I just wanted to share that perspective. And I also wanted to say before, uh, the name, which is every, everything is aligned, us being here, my great grandmother that I'm talking about, her name is Margaret Hart. <laughs> what are the chances? Wonderful, <laughs> wonderful. And ladies, as we are coming to the wrapping up of the session, we have about 15 minutes left. I want to ask uh, one question that was uh, presented uh, to the panel. But after we answer that question, it's, it's a fairly short one. I want each of you to think about your wrapping up statements in terms of inspiring our listeners with a message that you know has developed from your experience so while you think about that uh, the question for the panel is has your respective organization acknowledged that there is bias against women has that ever been acknowledged i know we've had I'll, go, I'll go first because my answer is really short <laughs> <laughs> No, <laughs> no, <laughs> no, there is acknowledgement that, that we're a minority, but, but that's about it. Okay, thank you. Antonio, what about your organization? Well, with 80% of, of women 
in, in teaching service in Trinidad and Tobago and around the region generally, I have to acknowledge something that there is bias notwithstanding the large number. And so, like I said, we started with the gender policy and we're hoping to bring it down. And yeah, we try to deal with it as the pockets arise, but you have, it's not blatant and open as in some sectors, but it is there. And so you have to deal with it as a case, on a case by case basis, really and truly. Yeah. Okay, great. And we've had uh, a lot of uh, forward action coming out of the TTPS, but I would still ask the question, has the TTPS at any point acknowledged bias against women? No, of course, um, you cannot totally eradicate bias because there will be the, the, the other cases where bias will be. But by and large, the organization do understand um, what it means to be all inclusive, and they need to because we serve a diverse community out there, and we need to be reflective of the community that we serve. And if we are talking the talk and, and, and asking men in the community and generally to eradicate bias and we're looking for equality for women, we have to lead by example. So I would say the yes, boldly, the organization has understood with what it means to be equal women to be equal and we have moved together with both the males and the females to address areas in the organization where there is any perception of bias wonderful all right and finally judalyn has your industry acknowledged bias against women I mean, they, every industry, I believe, they acknowledge it and they know it exists, but it's like pretending, almost like if I don't eat that cake tonight, I'm going to gain weight. It's like that. They know the, the fact that it's there. And I think that the problem with bias is that it's not gender specific. All of us have it. And I think because the men has... Um, the numbers in order to change that bias, we have to bring them into the conversation and into the solution because I am actually getting tired of the burden always being put on us, the women or the people of color um, to be the ones with the solution because we don't have the power else this wouldn't be happening. 3% of women wouldn't be plumbers. Um, would be, you know, it wouldn't be three, but it's 2.5, but that wouldn't change if we can do it. So I think that, um, a lot of them know that it exists, but they're not really making a, the best assist, a just you know, effort to to change it. So that, that that would be my honest answer. All right, thank you. I hear you. All right, so at this point, I would like to invite each of you to present maybe a concluding statement, something that gives direction, vision, and maybe we can start with Joanne to. Share with us some final thoughts, words on this um, International Women's Day Forum where we're looking at taking action against the bias. It is important to eliminate and address discrimination in the workplace. It is it, it, critical. And because women are a vital portion of the workforce, an organization that do not support women to join them missed out on half the population expertise and skills. Don't you agree? Yep. We are like salt. We in everything. And we contribute in a big way. And a fear, however, that being said, a fear and equitable workplace means taking advantage of the strengths of both genders. And as I mentioned, the TTPS we serve a diverse population out there. We address issues of gender bias, violence. So we need to be representative of the public that we serve. And as such, we need to rule by example. And I want, what I want to say to our men out there, the TTPS men, they did it for us on International Women's Day by understanding the role that we play. And I just want to, it's not my words, but what I want to say is say that men of quality support gender equality. Mm -hmm. so I want to appeal to the men out there, the employers, the legislators, as Antonia says, we must lobby for certain legislation to be put in place to ratify certain treaties and so forth. 
And I want to say on behalf of the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service and law enforcement generally, we rule by example, and we want the rest of the country to join with us. Agencies and organizations where there are females as members of staff recognize who we are and what we bring to the organization. And so that we can celebrate and continue to celebrate equality in the workplace. So I wanted to thank you if we are closing and say so what, what an experience it was to be sharing with these esteemed ladies here. And again, we want to urge the men, men of quality, support gender equality. Beautiful. <laughs> thank you. Uh, Antonia, closing remarks? I, I too would want to say thank you to Cipriani um, for hosting this webinar. Because what they've done is more than just host a webinar where we've spoken, and I'm grateful for the experiences shared by my fellow panelists and persons listening. They've given us a space and an opportunity for a voice. And that is what we need to see going forward. Always having spaces and opportunities for the women's voices to be heard, um, supported by men, as, as we've said earlier. And therefore, I do hope that there will be other opportunities and other agencies that will share and create spaces. I want to thank the men. And just to respond quickly to the question that was posed, men need to show up and support the women and show up as the best version of the men that they can be, which is what Joanne is saying. Once we do that and we have partnerships, then I think we are moving in the right direction towards gender equality and gender mainstreaming. Thank you for the honor of being here this afternoon and I look forward to continued service to Trinidad and Tobago. God bless. It has been a pleasure. Let me invite Shannon now to share her closing remarks with us. Well, I'd like to close by speaking to the young women that are listening to us and to empower them and to let them know that not only can they be anything that they want to be, but they can be everything that they want to be. And you have women like us on the panel, these uh, supporting and forging forward and marking a positive visibility for women and for your future. So move in the direction of your dreams because the women that that have forged the path ahead of you have done so for you. And I would also like to thank all of you and thank Cipriani for for having me tonight. It's been a it's been a real honor and it's been a privilege to get to chat to all of you tonight. Wonderful on their behalf. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. And Julian, your closing remarks for us. Yes, I would love to say I just like all the other women, um say, bring it up again, that we need our malice. That's my nickname uh, for the men, call them malice. We need our malice to join into to this because 60, women do 66% of the world's work. We only get 10% of the world's income and we only have 1% of the property. And we need to change that. And I think that any little girl that is listening to these amazing women that I can't believe that I'm on the stage right, but thank you so much. Uh, if they're listening to this, I want them to really dream a dream because this girl grew up, grew in, you know, growing up in Trinidad and Tobago, never thought that she would be a plumber and have the opportunities that I have. So I want them to conceive it, believe it, and do it and know that there is no stopping whatever they want to do and jobs truly don't have genders. And I, a little little side plug, my sons are police officers and I'm a union member, okay? <laughs> thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. So on behalf of the Elmo Francois Institute for Research and Debate of the Cipriani College of Labor and Cooperative Studies, for those of you who have joined us, thank you so much for your time. We have been discussing taking action against the bias as this year's theme. And let me just reiterate, we have been speaking with Joanne Archie, Assistant Commissioner of Police in Trinidad and Tobago, Shannon Hutchinson, she's a pilot, an author, and an award-winning artist, Antonia Tika de Freitas, President of the Trinidad and Tobago Unified Teachers Association, as well as the first vice president of the Caribbean Union of Teachers, and joining us, uh, Judy Lynn Cassidy, 
feminist plumber, founder, chief visionary officer of Tools and Tiaras Inc., and a tradeswoman, activist, and speaker. We have been sharing ideas, sharing our stories, and we do have a few more minutes, so I'm going to say it one more time. When we're looking at barriers and overcoming them, remember that barriers are artificial. And as women, have confidence in yourself. Go forward knowing that you are a unique opportunity for change in this world and for betterment. Have a vision for yourself. Create a personal legacy as well as a professional legacy and stick to that as you move forward in life. Um, do the best that you can at all times. Do the best and seize every opportunity that you have for development. And in that way, as we move forward in the generations, keep moving, we will see more equality. And I, I do like to use the word equity for women in our society. So thank each and every one of you for your contributions. I'm your moderator, Yemi Obubanke, and let me say thank you. Have a wonderful and safe evening and continue your excellent leadership work for not just women in Trinidad and Tobago, but men and women everywhere. Thank you so much.